We're here today with Darren Walton, who has written a book about his experiences and going to tell his story of his service in Vietnam. Uh, Darren, why don't you start us off by talking about how you ended up going into the Marines, what age you were, and uh, why you chose to be a jarhead? <laughs> Well, Larry, first of all, thanks for uh, having me on, and I appreciate you giving me a chance to uh, tell my story. Uh, out of high school, I was uh, uh, going to a local college, and my grades were failing because I was actually uh, having too much fun surfing and drinking beer and uh, smoking a little pot out there in California. We smoked a little pot. Uh, going out with the girls and, uh, and and having a really good time at college and my grades suffered. And at that time, this was before the lottery. And uh, if you didn't keep a certain grade point average, um, it looked like the draft was gonna come after you. So I elected uh, uh, to uh, look into the military because I really found that I wasn't a college student at the time, maybe a little immature to go to school or just was confused or just having too much fun. So I was uh, um, informed that uh, the draft was looking at me because I had some connections at the draft board with some uh, uh, guys who I used to hang out with. Uh, uh, one of the parents would work in the draft board and they said my uh, draft notice uh, looked like it was gonna be uh, delivered and what am I gonna do? So I tried to, uh, um, looking to going into the Coast Guard and they weren't uh, taking anybody. And I looked at the Air Force and the Navy and I didn't have uh, the qualifications that they uh, were looking for. So at the time I was a pretty good athlete and uh, uh, the Marine Corps had a real good track team. And uh, I was told that they have a special service uh, program where if you can uh, qualify that you could run for the track team for the Marine Corps, which was famous uh, at that time, having some uh, great runners. One was Billy Mills, who's the last American to win a gold medal in the uh, um, 10,000 meters in the Olympic Games. And he was kind of my idol. So uh, uh, they said that it looked like my times were good enough to qualify that I'd have to do some uh, 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 you know, you know, time trials for the Marine Corps but it didn't look like it was going to be a problem. So I signed up. As it turned out, I was looking forward to being an athlete running for the Marines and representing the Marine Corps uh, throughout the world in competition. Went through boot camp and, and uh, found that uh, uh, maybe I made a mistake, that the Marine Corps was uh, uh, a little restrictive for me. I was uh, not... Uh, I was a little insubordinate in boot camp. I thought boot camp was a little bit of uh, uh, a joke, and I thought, and I, I'd get uh, uh, laughing at the at the drill instructors yelling and screaming, and and at that time they did lay their hands on you, and, and they would choke you out sometimes, or kick you, or beat you up if you're really insubordinate and making them look bad because they have a platoon that they've got to get trained. Um, professionally and they like to have uh ribbons uh on their uh, platoon flag uh to march around on the uh what they call the grinder and i was kind of uh insubordinate and they put me uh uh, uh in what they call a motivation platoon and i lasted in that for about one week i came out of motivation platoon a good little marine my uh, boots were polished uh, my uniform was starched my brass was polished I learned um, a lot about the Marine Corps and uh, became, they broke me basically. As it turned out, um, did some time trials. They said that uh, I was good to go for, uh, the, to be on the Marine Corps track team. But unfortunately, I needed to sign up for uh, another year or two because uh, I was only a two year kind of a drafty uh, position which the Marine Corps uh, it was it's one of the few times the Marine Corps was doing a, a draft at the time, and and I wasn't I, I really didn't want to be in the Marine Corps for uh, any more longer than I had to be. And they said that's okay because you're going to Vietnam, and we have the uh, you've just been you just volunteered yourself to a recon 
uh, team. I never knew what recon was and never heard of it. And I, I went with the program, went to recon school and, um, and uh, the story goes from there. I uh, found that that was challenging and I really enjoyed the, uh, the guys I was with. They were tough, they were focused and we were going to go to Vietnam and win the war. And being Marines, that's, uh, we, we were, you know, we thought we could uh, go back there and make, go back to uh, Vietnam and uh, make a presence. As it turned out, uh, I going to Okinawa and in Guam and then Da Nang and had special training that's put into a team uh, with six other guys and uh, uh, our missions uh, I found out were going to be uh, uh, being inserted behind enemy lines and uh, with, with certain missions uh, our team the team I was on was mostly our missions were to uh, try to kidnap high-ranking officers and gather what documents we could and then uh, be extracted uh, out of these uh, zones. And I was on 21, what they call long range missions, um, where most of them failed. There's a few that we were successful, but most of them failed. Other missions were setting up uh, uh, ambushes or just gathering whatever ever intelligence we could. Uh, but all in all, I was in the jungles most of the time. With a good, with a real good team, uh, professionals that uh, I would not uh, hesitate to uh, ever not. I couldn't. There's nothing I could criticize about these guys I was with. Uh, what I found was with the training that we had, and recon teams today or Navy SEALs today are so much more uh, advanced training programs than what we had. So the guys I was with. I had to, over the years, had to really admire because we really lack the training that they have today. Um, but they had something else very special. They had a lot of grit. They were tough. They didn't complain. Um, I was the only one to complain, moan, and bitch most of the time. And I went from California, of course. The guys I was on the team with were farm boys from the Midwest where they lived down in the, the South. Uh, and then there was from me from uh, San Francisco, and they had a hard time dealing with me because I always questioned everything. And why are we doing this? And why are we doing that? And does this sound right? The, you know, this doesn't look good. Uh, uh, you know, how are we going to get? You know, we're going to get into a situation we can't get out of. Uh, I was um, what they call a secondary radio man. My my uh, when I was putting my first team, and. Uh, they would not give me hardly the time of day because as a newbie and we ran into some ambushes and I found that I wasn't a very good uh, radio man in the fact that I didn't like being shot at because I was carrying a radio and I didn't like the fact that the point man had walked us into some ambushes and he might get me killed. So as, as it turned out, uh, when there was an opening for a point man, uh, I took the position uh, because if I if I was going to get killed, I kind of wanted it to be my fault, not your fault or anybody else's fault. I didn't want to uh, have to rely on anybody. And I became a real good point man. After six, eight months in the jungle, uh, it was um, to the point where I was getting pretty comfortable being a point man. Now, you went in in 69? I went in the end of 69 and was mostly there in 1970. Okay. So, so it you was were, after Ted. You were, yeah, but you were still there during uh, a lot of the fighting and you were in I Corps. Is that correct? I was in I Corps and we weren't supposed to make contact or fight. That was the grunts that were doing that. And they were there again, uh, being a ranger, uh, recon ranger, we were, we got special treatment. Uh, back in base, we had cold beers, we had showers. Uh, maybe cold showers, but at least we had showers. We had a bunk, uh, hot meals, a real good mess hall. And, the, and our our missions were only to be, you know, maybe uh, six, seven days, no more than that. If we got, if we were out there longer than seven days, that means we were rent, we ran out of food and water, and uh, we were going to be uh, having uh, some issues with uh, trying to uh, uh, finish our mission. Where the grunts, on the other hand, they were out in the mud, the muck, 
uh, they, they're constantly uh, uh, making contact with the enemy. And we got the special treatments, but we bowed down to the grunts and they were the true Marines. They were in, in a number of times, they had to actually come out and save our lives because uh, we, we couldn't uh, uh, fight fight our way out of a paper bag sometimes we had no ammunition and there's only six of us and we get ourselves surrounded by nda and they'd come in and uh, uh help us out and uh then we would leave on the helicopter and they'd be stuck there fighting so um i corps was pretty hot at that time it, and uh uh there was a lot of areas uh, that i remember uh uh the missions were really i knew they were really going to be uh, tough and the grunts were going to get uh, uh, the, you know just beat up really bad so you probably heard these stories from Marine Corps grunts you know and uh, they you know they and the army grunts too I think the army you know maybe not as disciplined as the Marines um, and they got themselves in a little more trouble sometimes but I bowed out to them I, I give them uh those are the real soldiers in Vietnam. So uh, what we did was uh, work with intelligence. We get put into the same uh, category as an army LERP, and we're so far different from the army LERPs. And uh, there again, I have so much respect for a, a LERP because uh, they were out there for days and days at a time, and they never came back to what we came back to. We had a, a base camp we came back to that, like I said, was secure and had uh, racks. And uh, we had uh, what they call hooches. We, we stayed in hooches where the army lerps and, uh, uh, you know, they they were stuck out there sometimes out in the rice paddies and on a hill. Um, and they never had, uh, they made, you know, they, they were eating, um, you know, sea rats where we were had, uh, back in the rear we had a, a cafeteria so uh we had a little better but our missions were all done with the um what they called marine corps intelligence and we had a briefing and a debriefing of what our missions were going to be and they were different on uh, a lot of occasions and sometimes they weren't so different and our team uh was known for the uh, what they call uh, prisoner snatches and that's what we did mostly. And uh, you wonder how we did it. It wasn't that difficult when you're back in the uh, behind the lines and uh, you're in the, uh, the enemy's backyard and they think that they're safe and uh, nobody knows where they're at. And we're sitting there watching them and wait for the right moment. Well, we've got the element of surprise on our side. We go in there and snatch a, an officer and uh, what they call did him out, get him out of there. and. Uh, and we could probably uh, sometimes get two if we were lucky. So um, it was not like uh, uh, what you think about in the movies. We weren't that kind of, uh, uh, we, you know, we weren't the badasses that uh, everybody uh, tends to make us out to be. Uh, we, we, were, we were snooping and pooping is what <laughs> we were doing. So we were out in the jungles. And like I said, uh, a mission would last five, six, seven days, and sometimes longer during the monsoons where we get stuck out there, and that that was pretty bad because uh, we'd be what they call socked in, and uh, we'd have to rely on uh, 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 the CH forty sixes to find us and uh, extract us, and sometimes uh, it was so wet and rainy and foggy in the cloud cover was so low that they couldn't risk uh, trying to uh, look for us. And we just had to hunker down until we get a break in the, uh, in the weather. Now that said and done, you might have some questions about, uh, uh, you know, how we got in and got out. Well, first off, I think uh, you do what most veterans do and that's downplay the uh, heroism that you have experienced and uh, you has exhibited and the uh, dangers that you uh, experienced uh, and then praise others for the for what they went through. And I will praise all of those guys as well. But uh, having read your book, uh, to be uh, inserted either on a rope ladder, a Jacob's ladder, or propelled on, or to be dropped into a, uh, a clearing, uh, 
20, 30 clicks from uh, from wherever you were started off. And then your job is to try to uh, stay quiet and then snatch a couple of uh, high ranking uh, North Vietnamese. Uh, and you talk about that in your book, a couple of the experiences you had. Uh, that sounds an awful lot like the TV series now SEAL Team uh, and kind of the, some of the things they do, except there's a little different in environment. But when you talked about that, you you explained how you would got in and how you tried to uh, extract two of the Vietnamese. Now, even though they're comfortable and don't realize that uh, anybody's anywhere near them, uh, that's still an awfully dangerous thing. So could you explain a little bit, particularly the incident you talk about in your book, where you were able to uh, extract the two uh, Vietnamese officers? Mm -hmm. And once you did, the one thing that I kept wondering is, how in God's name did you keep them from struggling and making so much noise as you extracted them that you weren't uh, you weren't discovered? That yeah, good question. And we we were briefed really really well on some of these missions and knew exactly uh, what to expect. And so and these are other recon teams. Uh, providing information during their debriefings. And so we had, uh, we knew that the, uh, the debriefings were accurate. Uh, when you have two or three recon teams uh, looking at the same location and what you call a, a, a staging camp or, you know, an NVA, uh, uh, you know, uh, compound. We, we had a team, like I said, this team I was on was pretty exceptional. And we had on that one particular mission you're talking about, we had a lieutenant on the team. So I, I didn't have much respect for officers, uh, mainly because most officers, uh, I'm going off the subject real quick, but most officers that uh, um, ha had a reputation of uh, being, working up the ladder to end up going from lieutenant to colonel someday, being lifers, this is a career that they wanted uh, this is something that they uh, look forward to, and this is what their life was going to be. Uh, th then there are the guys like me who are doing their duty, but we weren't going to, uh, uh, we never wanted to make a career out of the military. So you have uh, uh, in the Marine Corps guys who are real Marines, and then guys who are just doing their job and, and can't wait to get back home. And uh, and my team had an officer, and uh, I, he had a, a real good reputation. So I knew, and he'd been in these dangerous situations and had a uh, uh, a lot of uh, these missions where they were prisoner snatches where he was involved in. And then I had a, a sarge who I walked point for a number of times. And we and I ended up being his uh, assistant patrol leader down there. You know, months later, but I, I was a good patrol. Uh, I was a good point man. So my job was just to get us there safely uh, to the compound, and then we would uh, hunker down. Without we'd be we'd be six guys uh, for days. We wouldn't say a word to one another. We wouldn't talk. It was all hand signals, and we were quiet. And we'd wait for um, a break in the security, and uh, uh, they would. Uh, two guys would rush through the compound, and knew exactly where to go. And it was usually early, early in the morning, and people were asleep, or uh, you know, or if they've been up all night, their their uh, guard is down. And when they got in there uh, to kidnap an officer. It was quick, and the two guys would jump on the guy on the on the one officer and uh, tape him up, tape his mouth. He couldn't talk, and get out of there as quick as he could. And if it was possible, grab another uh, person who was ready to make noise and tape them up and uh, get them out of there. And we did make noise, and we did uh, uh, make mistakes where uh, they found you know they. they they knew that we'd been in there and got out of there, and there was a, there was always a little noise, and it was always kind of dicey. 
So we had the element of surprise and we had a, a backup plan. And these guys I was with were really, really quick. And we did not have to uh, take time out to talk to one another or hand signals or come up with a game plan. We already knew what we were supposed to do. We knew our escape route and where to be. And the only problem was uh, if we got discovered, which I think the, the chapter you're talking about, we did get discovered and there was some rounds that uh, uh, came at us and one of the prisoners did get hit, um, but they still had to pull themselves together and we had time to, that time is, is what we need. That that's, uh, we, it, it, you're talking a matter of uh, minutes. If we have a minute or two on you, we can get out of there and uh, get to safety. But if we have less than a minute, uh, we could be caught and we got to keep the distance and uh, make it sound and make it feel to the enemy that there's more of us than there really is. And that's the history of uh, uh, First Recon is to, to, to be more powerful and, uh, and sound and be more than who than we really are and make such a commotion or be as quiet and not be seen and not uh, uh, be noticed and and let them uh, try to find us and know that they can't find us. That mission was, a it ended up, uh, it, you know, we accomplished some of it, but it was uh, a lot of missions like that fell apart. Uh, and it's just mistakes that happened that you can't control. That was, that what happened there was we were being shot at when the prisoners uh, had a slight wound and it started slowing us down and uh, uh, we we started dragging them with us with a good prisoner who we who could keep up with us and we were being uh, chased by the enemy and they're closing in on us and we knew they were closing in on us we could hear them they didn't know where we were but we knew where they were and we had to make some uh, uh, awful decisions at that time. So these decisions that we made are no different than you hear about these. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on Navy SEALs, but they have teams like what we, and, and missions like us, but they, they're a lot more sophisticated. So is recon today, like I said. Uh, and they're highly, highly trained, but they still make mistakes. And uh, the, the book, uh, I never saw the movie, and I read some of the book called Lone Survivor, and their incidences in that uh, book and the decisions that they had to make were just awful. And I think they made a, 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 a really hard decision. I'm not sure I could have made the decision that they made um, to, they ran, in, they, 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 they ran into a group of uh, uh, villagers who weren't friendly. And they had to uh, uh, kill, you know, a, a, a young uh, child. Uh, that decision had to be awful. Uh, but they didn't kill the child, is what I'm trying to go, is they should have, but they didn't because of the moral situation, what they would have to live with for the rest of their life. We had to kill uh, a prisoner because he was slowing us down and we couldn't risk uh, being captured. and uh, and. We, we killed uh, a prisoner that was just slightly wounded, but slowing us down to the point where we couldn't keep him alive and we couldn't just leave him there and have him um, uh, give instruction and direction of where we were. It, it, was, it was just too close. So uh, we had to make that decision and the officer and the Sarge had to make that decision more so than I did. And, uh, uh, that happened sometimes more than you wanted it to happen, but that's what that's what war is all about. And it's like um, the consequences are you don't know until years later. Now, the guys that uh, were on that team remember that incident as well as I do, except I um, there are details I don't remember. But uh, that's what recon teams have to do sometimes. And these guys, like I said, weren't trained like Navy SEALs. Uh, they didn't have those programs like they do today. So they were out there making decisions um, and, and it must have been agonizing to have to figure out the, 
the pros and cons and and uh, and we we brought in the corpsman to say okay we have to kill the prisoner let's use the morphine you know because we couldn't shoot him and uh because that would give away our position even more so the it was a dilemma and the navy corpsman uh uh said he you know, he had orders to um you know, off the prisoner with an overdose of morphine and he refused he says i need this morphine for the guys on the team in case one of us gets hit and uh he wasn't going to jeopardize uh or you use the morphine for uh the enemy when you know he might have to use it for one of us because you guys have to do what you have to do but you're not using my morphine so he was up for court martial actually for disobeying orders from a lieutenant and uh but it never came to that uh, it uh we, we, we it made sense what he was saying so um we had to use our k-bar and uh kill the end killed uh the prisoner and it was uh um uh, wasn't like in the movies it wasn't uh um anything that you would expect and so these are kids that are 19 20 years old and you have a lieutenant might be 22 or 23 years old and um i look back and i go this is um something that we weren't trained to do you know it uh, uh it, it it was uh something we never rehearsed and we never practiced we didn't know that the situation would ever come up with and um it was haunting it, it has haunted me until the day i wrote this book about how those guys on that team how you know how they uh handled this later on in life and so for 40 years we couldn't we really didn't have reunions or get togethers because the only thing we had in common were these missions and some of these missions we didn't didn't want to ever uh, bring up in conversation so other than that we had nothing in common except us being uh, rangers and and they are my brothers i love them dearly i have uh, written this book michael cofino who is an attorney who helped me write this book vetted everything in the book helped me contact these guys and we never missed a beat when we uh, we had some zoom meetings and some phone calls and it was like we we were um we were back together and but we kind of skipped over you know we'd go like remember that mission remember this mission but we never talked about certain missions like we're talking about right now so in the book it was hard for me to go into detail about some of this uh, dilemmas some of the situations <clears throat> that uh, uh, we were put through and it would be nice if we could get together someday and have uh, a reunion but under the circumstances we don't want to bring up some of the uh, subjects that uh, would be triggering for some of these guys and i know that uh, uh, they don't want to go there and they don't want to talk about it and there's nothing else i mean we you know we talk about our health what meds we're on uh you know how many times we've been married about our kids but we never ever go back to some of these missions and uh, and i think um it, it's something that maybe needs to stay in the closet and i'm not sure i made a mistake by putting it in the book but it's for you to read and for you to uh uh for the public to read and that they can maybe understand why some of these guys coming home uh have a, a difficult time readjusting you also talk about a mission in your book where you were walking point and had a very unpleasant surprise with uh, uh, the enemy. And yeah. that seemed to have a, a profound effect on you as well. Would uh, Do you want to talk about that a little bit? That's a good chapter too. Um, in, in the Marine Corps, we're, you, you know, Marines aren't fighters. Everybody says the Marines are the best fighters and there's no better fighting force uh, in the world and we're the most trained. And we're, we're not fighters, but what we are is killers. And we know how to kill. After, after saying that, also a Marine is a warrior 
and he knows how to uh, protect and he wants to protect he wants to protect those who can't protect themselves uh he wants to protect for a lot of reasons mostly uh he's a warrior for peace and uh he gets put in the situations where uh he has to um realize that uh something's uh gone wrong now we're programmed recon i i I went to recon school and graduated, and I got a certificate that I'm supposed to be proud of that shows that I've been indoctrinated. And the indoctrination is is a, a tool to give you the confidence and uh, the will to go into the jungles and survive the jungle and to do your job, which is to kill. So as a point man, I was good. Uh, my senses were just... Uh, uh, activated. I could hear and smell. I could uh, sense things that uh, uh, other people, you know, uh, couldn't for some reason. I could tell that we were, and I had a good, like I said, a good backup team. And and so when I was looking in one direction, uh, the team leader would be looking above me. So we worked together. As, it's amazing, six guys working together and, and, and coordinating um, uh, together and putting the same amount of energy together uh, on the trails. And everybody, if I'm looking one way or looking down, the patrol leader, he's looking out and up. So we always have a view of what's going on out there. And our backup is if we get in trouble, they set up a perimeter and open fire while I have an M79 and I'm able to shoot what they call a, a white phosphorus grenade with this blooper to make a smoke screen that would protect us for a while because uh, the enemy wouldn't want to go through the uh, the smoke because it burns them so walking point i you know in the jungles um the m16 uh was a ridiculous rifle that was assigned to me to walk point with and it um it, it was more of a long range weapon it wasn't for you know uh close uh, jungle warfare. Uh, M uh, the AK-47 was actually. I saw some of those. And I had one for a while where it had a, um, a the stock that uh, folded down and, and it was easy to uh, uh, manip manipulate through the jungle, through the vines, and and uh, and carry a lot easier. Where the M16 had a long barrel and we get tangled up uh, real easy. And then it sometimes worked, sometimes didn't. If you didn't, you know, it's really hard in the jungles and the mud and the muck and the rain to keep it uh, clean. And so sometimes it jam up on you, which happened to me on occasion. So I'd walk point with an M79, which uh, is a shotgun round that I had in there. This is one round. And it uh, uh, gave me a little bit of advantage. I wasn't, when I sh aimed at you and pointed it at you, it didn't matter if I killed you or not. Most of the time, it didn't kill the person I aimed and shot, but it put them down enough where we could uh, buy time. That's what I said. We need time to set up a perimeter and figure out, uh, you know, we got uh, radio coordinates and and uh, we could do a little firefight and get out of there before uh, they get reinforcements. On this occasion, uh, I've been in the jungles now probably six, eight, nine months. And I had killed a few people. I never seemed to bother me until I killed this. Uh, we made point to point contact and we made eye contact. And I'd done that a number of times, but this time our eyes locked. And I knew right there, one of us is going to die. And, and uh, I, I was the lucky one to survive. After it was all said and done, the body, uh, we, we searched the body uh, for whatever papers and documents and stuff like that. Uh, I tried to figure out uh, who who this NVA regiment was. And uh, uh, in, on the inside pocket, uh, there were some letters that he had from home and uh, from his family. And he, he um, was young. He's probably the same age as I was, maybe even younger. I, I think he's probably 19, 20. And and I realized that he was he had letters in his pocket like I had letters in my pocket that I stuffed away and, and read on occasion in the jungles because of uh, downtime and, and uh, 
uh, just bored and you and you it's nice to have something from home. He had pictures of his uh, family, and I had pictures of my girlfriends and my family back home in, in my jacket pocket, too, on the inside. And I knew right there that this guy wasn't uh, doing anything but his job and protecting his country from me. And I was just doing my job, doing what my country wanted for us to do. Uh, for whatever reason at the time i started having doubts about winning the war now and um i had uh empathy i had uh uh i i had uh, realized that this enemy was a formidable en enemy and uh i just killed somebody who was the same age as me about this you know a little shorter than me but uh young and he had a family and he had a life to live and for what purpose and reason did he die for and uh and maybe he had more reason to die uh for his country than i uh had for mine at that time i started having doubts and started questioning what the war was all about but when you lock eyes with somebody who you know you have to kill right now um you you've pretty much absorbed his energy his soul uh and it's something that you don't share with anybody. You keep it a secret for, you know, you know till, if you live long enough, maybe uh, you uh, kind of, what, what you do is it's, um, I forget what, you know, it's something that you don't want to share, but you know that you have to, and that maybe somebody will realize that uh, killing is, killing the soldiers that you're fighting against really aren't the enemy that uh and in my mind being a marine and being indoctrinated being conditioned to kill gooks because uh, gooks weren't uh, human they're bad guys and i think that this guy you know he he loved his country he loved his family and he's put in a situation probably had no no control over uh what he was doing and he happened to run in, into me at that day and it was my luck that I survived and his luck that he died and uh, and you wonder why did, you know that did that happen and I can still draw a picture I can tell you exactly what he was wearing I can tell you uh, what his uniform looked like I can tell you what weapon he had I can tell you his belt buckle if it was uh, rusted or polished or, or corroded I can tell you about the boots he was wearing I can tell you about the pack he had uh, what weapon, you know, weapon he was carrying. I can tell you how close we were. I, you know, it, it um, and it, it, in a way he's in me, he's in my head and, uh, uh I'm going to live with it for the rest of my life. So I think I'm, I'm at that point in my life that I've lived long enough that I'm not afraid to come out of the closet and hopefully with these other wars going on that, uh, I make I have some influence on some young soldier who wants to be a warrior, who wants to be a Marine, who wants to be a Navy SEAL and go be a hero or um, do their job for the country to really think about what they're doing before they do it. Uh, I didn't think about it too much. I just went with the program. And uh, it's uh, these kids coming home today, I feel for them. It, uh, it, uh, I feel like... Uh, they have their Vietnam like we had ours, and they have questions that are going are, are going to not be answered when they get out, and they're going to lose friends, and they're going to uh, see the enemy. And some of them are, are what they call close quarters, where they're in the cities, and the, you never know who's behind that door. Uh, I want them to know that um, if they kill somebody, that it was a just killing that it was it was a must killing and it uh, has to if you're killing and you don't feel that uh um you don't feel it then you're soulless and maybe um uh you, you got you got other problems but i want these kids to know that uh it's not easy to go through life once you kill somebody right wrong good or bad i'm not judging that's just uh uh going you know these wars you know you have to ask yourself are they just wars or have you know you know are they uh realistic wars 
Um, so Vietnam, I, I told you about before I went in, I, I believed that it was a just war and I won't get into the reasons and the politics, but I believed in America as a patriot. I still am today. Uh, it's just everybody's situation is different and they're going to, uh, I've been ridiculed in the fact that I might be questioning and judging uh, the war. And I think most of my, uh, most enlisted have been due. It's the officers that say it was a just war, it had to be done. And we're, and I've heard stories that people even think that we won the war. And, uh, and I ask, well, would, would we win? And uh, um, not to get political, but uh, I, I, after 40 years or 50 years since Vietnam, it's been a balancing act uh, of me saying this was a stupid, stupid war. Then I've met people, uh, refugees from Vietnam who love the American soldier and they are here in America living the American dream because of us. And they have stories that if you give, uh, give them a chance and listen to what they have to say, you might have made some, um, you know, you, you, you know, how should I put it? Uh, you, you might have done something right. But on the other hand, you talk to a parent that lost a son and they ask you, uh, would he die for? And I don't have an answer. And so, uh, and I think a lot of Vietnam was uh, originally, you know, we, you know, there, there was a, a problem with uh, the communists, uh, you know, with Russia and China. There was, uh, at that time we were growing up, there was uh, uh, a problem with the communists taking over countries. And uh, it was, uh, um, uh, you had a, a Czechoslovakia in our lifetime, you had uh, Yugoslavia in our lifetime, uh, conquering and taking over neighboring countries. Uh, you had uh, East Germany, who they built the wall so the people wouldn't uh, come to a Western country. Uh, and it seemed like everybody behind the Iron Curtain was uh, miserable and they needed to be freed. And, and I was going to be that warrior. But all in all, after being in Vietnam, uh, we were there way too long, and I felt after being in the jungles as long as I was, I saw too many people die, and I couldn't, I didn't have an answer why. They, why did they get killed? And they weren't, they weren't heroes. They, they were just doing their job, and they were just normal like I was. And um, there were a lot of us there who were just doing what we thought was right. But why can't America, the biggest, strongest military in the world? Um, win a war in a country that most people can't find on the map. It's so small. And so I come home and I, I come home to the Bay Area, San Francisco, and there was a lot of resentment, a lot of hate towards the soldiers coming home. Maybe in the Midwest, uh, soldiers came home to parades. Uh, but out here, it was awful. And uh, and I started thinking maybe the hippies and the protesters uh, were right uh, that we need to get out of this war. And then you mentioned Kent State, and when when you have college kids getting uh, killed by uh, um, you know our, uh, National Guard, you wonder what's going on in this country. And then uh, you can't talk about where you've been, what you did, and you can't talk about real heroes uh, going in the villages and working with the villagers and, and protecting the villagers. And, and uh, uh, you hear about Milai and some other atrocities, but I saw atrocities that the NBA did that were just as horrific. And I saw American Marines and, and soldiers giving everything they could to the villages and protecting them. Now, I'd never seen, seen things that went on you might remember uh there's some stupid things that went on where soldiers killed a, a water buffalo and and that that's not having respect for the people of uh, that country and builds resentment but all in all the marines that i knew and i worked with gave everything they could to the village to help the village out um and sometimes you'd wake up uh the next morning, that village would be completely burned down because they were friendly to us. 
and the NBA would come in and uh, completely uh, demolish it. So when I came home, yeah, I had some. Uh, uh, I wanted I wanted to talk about uh, what Americans are like, what Americans do, and all in all, I wanted to say Americans are, are really uh, good people. Uh, they're brave people. They do things that are extraordinary, uh, but nobody wanted to hear uh, on this end of, of the uh, continent. So I went back to school and um, I kind of wanted to fit back into college. By the way, I did go back to college and I made the dean's list. <laughs> I, know, I know what an education is about now and I took school serious. I loved it. I still surfed and drank beer and uh, um, uh, but trying to fit in now, I kind of didn't never uh, fit in uh, uh, with my peers or, you know, if you get a girlfriend, I got, you know, uh, how, you know your girlfriend asks you where you've been, with, how come you're older than everybody in college and, and what'd you do for a living? And you say you're in the Marine Corps. And, uh, they go, oh, that's okay. You weren't in Vietnam. Yeah, I was in Vietnam. Uh, okay, that's all right. But you didn't, you weren't in combat. Yeah, I was in combat. And now they have issues with you because they think you're a psychopath because of, uh, of all the uh, media and, uh, and what they're seeing on TV and hearing about uh, combat soldiers that they got to screw loose and that they're, they're crazy. Uh, they might be a little bit right, but uh, it, uh, it, was, it was like really difficult. So I grew my hair long and uh, became a hippie and went to some protests and uh, lived on a little commune for a while. And that, you know, that didn't work out very well because I had hard, even on a commune, the hippie commune, you still got chores and people giving you orders on, on, on you know, when, when to wash dishes and, and uh, clean the kitchen and when you're gonna peel potatoes or go work out in the garden. And if the surf's up and you go out surfing before you do your chores, they, they're not too keen on that. So I didn't last very long. Um, but I, I kept my mouth shut and uh, uh, never told anybody again where I'd been and what I did. And I got a girlfriend and, and, uh, and life was good. I was living a lie. I was, I was the coward for a long time. So I think this book was uh, uh, for me to admit that uh, I had changed a little bit. I'm proud of my guys now. And uh, uh, and I want them to know how uh, uh, there, there are people in that book that actually were instrumental in me coming home alive. And they put their lives on the line unconditionally when they didn't have to. And that's what I'm saying about it. A lot of the Americans that I know, that's what they do without hesitation. So I met these guys and I've had my time with them and I've told them uh, how much I love them and how I know what I know who they are, and they're walking among us, and they are uh, incredible individuals, and they'll never tell you how much uh, uh, they did in the jungles to save our lives. They were assigned to our team to specifically come out in a hot fire zone to extract us and take rounds to save my team's life. They couldn't leave us out there. That's the kind of what a Marine does. They, uh, they're not gonna leave, leave you out there to die. Though there were occasion when a squadron couldn't come out and get us because it was so hot that they couldn't lose a helicopter. Uh, they couldn't lose any more men. But then there were squadrons that said they didn't care. They turned the radios off and said, did you find cover, we're coming in. And, uh, uh, we'll come in with guns blazing, and hopefully we're not so close we don't hit some of you guys. They are the ones that I contacted to let them know um, that they're the heroes, and they're tough, and they're brave, and that without them, I, I wouldn't have come home, and a lot of recon teams wouldn't have come home. What's interesting, one of those guys was a helicopter gunner for the Purple Fox Squadron who we, we worshiped because they uh, were a group of guys who were, they drank hard and, and uh, played hard and they came out and they risked their lives more times than none when they didn't have to. 
I was in high school in a little town called Novato. Uh, basically, we lived outside an Air Force base in Northern California. And in high school, there was this guy, his name was Dennis Welch. He was a football player a year older than me. And I'd get in trouble and I'd get in fights and he'd kind of protect me. And, and uh, uh, over a period of time, he'd come out to track meets and watch me run. And um, he was a shot putter and a discus thrower. And so we, we, knew, we were on the same track team together. And I was uh, uh, a local, you know, I, I was the best runner in, in the county in, in Northern California. And, um, and they would come out and cheer me on. Well, he was there the same year I was there, and he was a helicopter gun for the Purple Foxes, and they're the ones that inserted us into a lot of these hot uh, landing zones, LZs. We met up, you know, at a reunion, a high school reunion years later, and, you know, we just, we had a short conversation, and I just, he just blew me away that he said he was a, you know, a purple fox. I asked him for his call sign. I knew his call sign. He knew my call sign. I go, gosh, Dennis, you know, we, we're on the same chopper together. And that, then again, we hadn't seen that. That was like 10, 15 years after uh, Vietnam, and we haven't talked or seen each other until just recently. And I go, you remember that uh, reunion we had? And he goes, uh, I do, like it was yesterday. He goes, I can't believe you're on the same chopper I was uh, for all those missions. And uh, he goes, you could have said hi to me. And I said, well, geez, Dennis, you're, you're wearing all this armor and gear on you. I, I, you're, I'm not looking, not making eye contact. I'm kind of like wondering how I got myself in this situation. You can put us in a real bad landing zone and I'm wondering how much contact we're going to make. He, I go, you could have said hi to me. You know, I'm sitting right next to you. And he goes, well, you're all painted up. You know, you got your camouflage on. He goes, you guys, I did, you know, I, I didn't know who you were, Darren. And so now we've reconnected and uh, we're hoping to do some talks uh, about Vietnam and about the Marine Corps uh, and who the real heroes are. Uh, it's not recon. It's the support that we had and um, the guts of these guys to come and get us. And these are your air wing that you had in the Marine Corps, uh, what they call OB-10 pilots and uh, aerial observers, uh, the Cobra pilots coming out, saving our ass. And uh, what they call, uh, 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 I'm not sure, it's called a Seahawk or something. It's a uh, a CH-46 chopper coming, you know, dropping the ladder and keeping that helicopter stable, taking rounds while we're climbing up the ladder and start to look like Swiss cheese. Uh, those are, you know, that pilot had to have big kahunis. I mean, this just it save our lives. So when you see Navy SEALs out there, I suspect that uh, there are other special forces and, and uh, black ops and all that. You hear about the missions that they're successful and how much they trained and they had uh, hell week and then they had buds training and the, you know they did all these uh crazy ass uh, military uh exercises um and how they go into these uh real real hot zones to save a, a save a life or or uh, kidnap somebody or to, to find somebody who's been kidnapped by the enemy most of those missions are failures. You don't hear how many times they fail and who got them out of those situations. Those are the heroes. They had to go out and they didn't have the training or the background that these Navy SEALs or special operations groups have. Um, and they need to get more recognition because uh, it's not just a, a recon team. It's everybody working together. And um, they... They don't show that or talk about how these uh, other groups are in the rear more times than none going to pull you out and they're going to save your life. And you owe your life to some of these guys in the rear in the support groups that you don't ever hear about. They don't get the citations or the medals or the recognition uh, that we get. And uh, uh, recon in the Marine Corps walks on water when all in all, it's not just us, it's the whole team that's supporting us 
that you don't hear about all. And so I wanted to write the book to thank these guys and let them know I know who they are. And they're they're amazing individuals. I wanted to lighten it up just a tad. Anybody that had been in country, and I told you this before we started, had heard urban legends. And oh, okay. We all had heard about, uh, we all encountered the FU lizards and, um, <laughs> and you remember those. And, um, you know, you'd hear about tigers in the field and you'd hear actual stories or see pictures. But you always heard about the rock apes and everybody thought that they were kind of an urban legend. And in your book, you have a picture of a rock ape for real. And you also talk about being in an encounter with one, which I thought was, that had to be hairy because here you're, you're out trying to avoid the enemy. And now you come up against something else, which is a, nat a natural enemy, which is a whole lot different. And I might, I, I thought you might want to talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I'll start off with back in Camp Pendleton, going through recon school and we had a gunny sergeant who was uh, uh kind of in charge of our team and we you know we, we'd run a lot and uh, do different exercises and practice what they call quick kill and uh, uh we would do rehearses rehearsals and stuff like that uh, on certain situations and we graduated and we're putting uh, some little bleachers uh you know out on a marching deck their uh grinder and he goes i'm proud of you guys uh um you guys are going where i've been uh you, you guys are well trained some of you won't come back but most of you are so well trained i, I have the confidence that you're coming back and i got one thing to say to you and i'm going to say it to you and i want you to listen to me he goes this is a word of wisdom don't fuck with the rock ape. We all laughed. What the hell is a rock? We thought it was the funniest thing. We thought he was joking, you know, and he goes, don't fuck with the rock ape. And that was that. So then we get to Vietnam and we hear stories about from other teams where they spotted some apes, some rock apes. And, uh, you know, it, to me, it was an urban legend, you know, and, uh, the legend was it was a, a rock ape was kind of like a big foot foot in the jungles from people who said that they think they saw him or, or they saw a silhouette of a big, you know, uh, ape man in the jungles. And and there was no proof or evidence of any rock apes whatsoever. They're only indigenous in, in a, uh, maybe two areas of all of Vietnam, not very big areas. And i -Cor, one's called near a place called Monkey Mountain. The other one's up in the jungle, some uh, in the mountains. And we were on a mission and it's dark in the jungles and, um, uh, you know, it's still light. And we had uh, uh, an ambush set up uh, for the enemy because we found a, a trail that was uh, looked like a well-worn trail and um, looked like it was a supply trail to uh, maybe for the rice uh, uh, guys carrying rice bags to the enemy. It was anyway, well-worn. And, and um, so we, we, uh, set up an ambush and there were uh, I saw that these were apes in our kill zone and I knew not to shoot them somebody on the team shot one and I go oh no and we now our position was uh, compromised enemy knew where we were they heard that shot and so we had to what, what we call get him out you know, uh, get out of there because now the enemy knows where we're at. And so for hours, we, we got out of, the, out of that area and got up on what they call a minute, you know, uh, a bivouac, an observation post on a little hill. And uh, uh, we're bedding down for the night and, uh, you know, setting up radio watch. And all of a sudden, the sun's going down, it's getting dark. And we get this grass and mud and some rocks, you know, cascading on us. We go, what in the hell is that? And the noise was just tremendous. Uh, you know, this uh, family of uh, apes out there were having uh, uh, 
a, a fit with us and they were yelling and screaming and they, they didn't know what to do with us and they're picking up whatever they could now that when they threw they threw kind of they didn't throw overhand they threw underhand but they were tossing uh chunks of uh, uh roots and mud and and uh, uh rocks lots of rocks and it got so bad that now it's dark and these guys aren't lit up and if we shot shot them um our muzzle flashes would give our position away so we called uh for an emergency extraction that were being attacked so they came out with a, a a chopper dropped the ladder so we could get out of there and we had to go to a debriefing and um at the debriefing they go now how many of the enemy were there and we said oh just maybe six or seven and uh, can you describe them were they Viet Cong, NVA? Who were they? Well, they're rock apes. And they, these officers, went crazy. We pulled you out of the jungle because of some monkey. You're trying to say that you were attacked by a monkey. And we're trying to justify ourselves because these guys heard the story of rock apes. But then again, it was a uh, something that they'd never uh, encountered. And, and, uh, uh no no other teams had been extracted because of them but later on there i found out that that this was not an uncommon situation uh these apes are maybe hardly four feet tall uh they tracked us down uh they were different colors they're calico colors black uh brown reddish brown they were pissed uh they were pissed at us because we killed one of their family members and uh, they're showing their dissatisfaction the best that they could and so um yeah they're uh they're for real and there's more more teams teams that were out there uh I had seen them uh and and encountered them also not just us and they're <laughs> you don't want to deal with the rock apes and i can remember after it was all said and done the sarge saying later on the sarge says you're going to be in an area and don't fuck with the rock apes and we did <laughs> and now we're paying for it and uh well we we were the laughing stock of uh, camp reasoner uh uh for a long time but that said and done there are a lot of grunts seeing them out there uh marine corps grunts and uh uh they're they're not a big foot that 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 there's nothing that this that that's all made up and people who said that they see rock apes or Bigfoot, that's kind of like, I'm not sure that they're telling the truth because it, it's just a, um, it's, it's it's an ape, you know, but you don't want to mess with them. And uh, uh, I don't think there's they're, they're around anymore, but they were uh, people who lit that, how should I put it, uh, had patrols around uh, Monkey Mount, north of uh, Da Nang, uh, uh, seen them quite, quite often. But I heard about him for the longest time and didn't believe that there was such a thing either. So, uh, and it, but uh, uh, I witnessed it. I got a picture of one and um, uh, and you don't mess with them. Well, you're the first so, person that I know that actually encountered them in Vietnam. I've only heard of them as legends. So now, yeah. I, have it, now I have the proof. <laughs> I, I'm not telling a lie there. I, uh, I don't know if it's a rock ape, but they were, um, this is what we call the rock ape, and they're more like a big baboon, I think, you know. Uh, and um, and there was nothing uh, mysterious about them. Uh, I bet they have some fierce teeth. They do, <laughs> they do. Your and picture, I saw your picture shows that. Uh, and I and I'm not sure that uh, I would. Um, I think I'd rather uh, deal with the the Bengal tigers than the rock apes. <laughs> Well, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your story? Well, I tell you what, I think uh, uh, my intentions are, and I'm, I'm going to probably go on some, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to be giving some book signings and, and uh, speaking a little bit. And I'm hoping that we can, uh, and, and with you guys helping me out and with this video going uh, for other military veterans coming home, you and I, I'm hoping we are an example and that uh, we don't do what happened to anyway to to a group of guys that I know coming home and not uh, 
receive uh, these guys coming home uh, without honor. And, uh, and it's, it's not, it's not, um, they're doing their job and they're doing the best that they can. And they got their hands tied and these rules of engagement that there shouldn't be, if we're going to win a war or fight a war, we have to, to go in there with a commitment, get in and get out instead of staying there for many, many years. But these young guys coming home, I think you and I as vets have got to uh, be there for them and let them know what they're going to be going through um, and that uh, it's all right. And they're, um, they are uh, looked up at, that I, I really care about them. And, and I don't know about society, but if you've been in war, you know, um, and you've been, you, and, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a combat vet in the jungle or in a combat zone. You know what being scared is, and and you know that uh, there's a chance that you 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 see your buddy go next to you, uh, and you don't know if that you're going to be the next, or a rocket or a mortar lands in on your lap, uh, or a chopper gets shot down, or uh, there's so many things that happen in the war zone that they should be able to come home with honors. Um, now they got put there not because of um, what they did. They got put there because of what we did. As a society, we're responsible for what happens to them. Right, wrong, good or bad, uh, that, that's debatable. But when you go and put these kids into a, a war situation, uh, we're responsible. All of us are. You can't you can't put the blame on one group of people. Uh, we're all it's it's just what it is. And when they come home, I don't think Vietnam vets. It took years before Vietnam vets got the recognition and got the needs that they needed, the help that they needed. And I want to make sure that uh, when these guys go to combat, that uh, that we're there to help them, and that. I'm hoping, and it looks like your organization is doing that. And that's why I'm going to uh, give $36 to sign up and I give more later on. Uh, I, I like, um, I like it. I don't think anybody's profiting. I don't think anybody's making a lot of money uh, for what you're doing. And I think um, I'm, I'm going to help promote your uh, cause. I love these guys coming home and I think they need us. And, uh, and I've been I've, I've been the coward for too long, and um, I'm out of the closet now. And I'm sorry, but you, you're going to get an earful if you give me a chance. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time to record your interview, and uh, just want to say welcome home. Thank you, thank you. Okay, you ready? I, I would like to say one more thing uh, that's uh, especially dear to me. In the show you talked about the uh, uh, we talked about uh, the rear and how they uh, you know helped us uh, uh, and saved our lives. Uh, the security that we had was tremendous. We, we talked about um, the chopper pilots, the uh, uh, the chopper uh, gunners. We talked about the Cobras. We talked about the OV-10 Bronco pilots and and uh, aerial observers. I remember one time we were being chased and I could see the helicopter landed and the uh, gunner was just blazing. He had a, it was a M50 and uh, tracer rounds going by. And then we're being chased and, and rounds coming from behind me. And if I can make it to that chopper, I know I'm gonna be safe. And I'm running and I'm a fast runner and my team is passing me. And I was better. I was a faster runner than anybody on the team. And they're they're fat. We're running for our lives, literally. And if we can get that shop where we know that we're safe, all of a sudden, in the opposite direction, there's a guy running the opposite way. And I'm going, "Are you crazy? We got to get to that chopper, and they can't wait for us. And we got to get out of here. We're going to get killed. We're getting overrun." I get in the chopper. I get behind the gunner, and I'm looking at what's happening. And he's trying to protect and give us give us time because the enemy is right there in the uh, tree line. This 
guy who passes me the opposite direction is a Navy corpsman. And he's got two guys down. And he's patching up one guy with an open chest wound, gluing him up. And he's shooting the other guy up with morphine because he has to make a decision who's going to live and who's going to die that day. He's doing the best that he can. And here we're the big badass Marines, the warrior Marines. I'm not leaving that chopper because if I leave that chopper, there's a good chance I'm going to get killed. That Navy corpsman was trying to save those guys' lives. Now, he couldn't carry both of them. Somebody from the chopper jumped out to go help him. But it wasn't me. I, I knew I was safe, and I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm not going out there to jeopardize, jeopardize my life uh, for two guys that are down who might be dead. Uh, that's an indication that shows you that you don't have to be a Marine to be brave. These Navy corpsmen, they had no idea what they're getting themselves into when they got assigned to a recon team. But when they did, they were amazing individuals. And I've never forgotten these Navy corpsmen and how many lives that they saved and putting their lives on the line like they did. And um, uh, I talked to a couple of them and they're incredible individuals even still today. Now you talk about PTSD, it, it's not just combat vets. Uh, it's, it's guys who were uh, uh, being uh, hammered out there uh, uh, behind uh, uh, you know, a fence line, you know, perimeters and uh, nurses, Navy corpsmen, uh, and, and then the combat vets. But I didn't want you to uh, end with not giving credit to these Navy corpsmen. I love them. And, and uh, uh, it, uh, someday I would like to, uh, uh, in Vietnam, write a, I, I've, I've got enough information about some of the heroic things that people need to hear about these Navy corpsmen. So. Uh, that said and done, one other thing. You mentioned that the if I wrote the book or not. I started this book three years ago, and I'd write a chapter, and I couldn't finish it. And my wife, Gina, would say, come on, Darren, let's finish this chapter. Well, after interviewing some individuals and, and uh, trying to, my, my memory isn't so good, uh, I, there, there's things I just can't remember. Uh, I can remember some stuff, but not everything in detail. And so I'm I'm stuck. And then these guys would say, well, Darren, you're on my patrol and you were walking point and this is what happened. And I don't remember it happening, but they do. And they swear that I was there. So I'm trying to write a chapter and I can't finish it. My wife says, let's go up to the coast. Let's get a house, a cabin on the on the bluffs over the ocean, and you can go uh, spear fishing, kayaking, you can go diving, and um, uh, we'll have a good weekend so you can clear your mind. So we get up the coast, a place called Sea Ranch, and I get ready to go in the ocean, go spear fishing, and she said, We're not going anywhere until you finish that chapter. <laughs> so I go, Okay. So I spend a day writing a chapter. And I'm real happy about it. It looks good. I'm, I read it. I go, man, that's a great chapter. And she looks at me. She goes, where'd you learn how to spell? She goes, you know, <laughs> your, 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 your sentence structure is all wrong. And why don't we do this? And why don't we change that? So she worked on that chapter with me. And then Michael Cofino, who is a ghostwriter attorney who vetted everything in the book and helped me find uh, these guys who I interviewed. Uh, he's a he's a pretty good writer would look at the chapter that i just wrote and would give it to him the proofread and he goes god darren look at you you're a good writer <laughs> i didn't tell him my wife wrote it <laughs> i get all the credit so uh larry basically you know it um i had help and uh so people think that i'm a writer and i'm really not but it, the story um is basic and simple and i didn't want to uh i've read i've read some vietnam books memoirs and stuff and they're all really really good but i wanted to keep this simple if you picked it up i wanted it to be an easy read and i'm working on some other projects and i needed to get this book um it's the foundation of where i'm going with another story and so um i'm glad you read it and, and thank you for the fine comments
I, and I love the title because anybody that was in Vietnam knows Didi Ma. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and on, you're right. And, and on that, I think we should Didi Ma. So thanks again for uh, being a part of this. And. Uh,